Kia ora. All right, we might kick off. Um, people keep filtering in. That's fine. Hi, I'm Vanessa Blackwood. I'm from the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. I'm a policy advisor there. And this session will be about the intersection between privacy and copyright. Just before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Vivian over, over there is our TUI rep. If you have any concerns at any point, just go and shout out to her. Vivian will also be running our mics for this discussion um, and keeping track of time, etc. We've got an hour. Just um, a reminder as well, this is live streamed and it will be recorded. So if you don't feel comfortable being recorded, make sure that you sit out of range of the camera and also make sure that any questions you ask, you are asking them into the mic so that people who are watching by live stream can hear you because this is a discussion session, not just me talking at you for an hour, which would get probably pretty boring. Um, there are also shared collaborative notes on the NetHui website. So if you'd like to go and add notes to those um, collaboration documents, that would be great. In terms of the kaupapa of the discussion session, just be aware that this is a chance for everyone to participate. So be mindful of how much time you're taking up with making points. Um, if you see that other people have points to make, that they've got their hands up and they haven't yet had a chance to join in the conversation, perhaps think about ceding the mic to them and making sure that everyone feels safe and welcome to have their um, points raised so that everyone everyone's voices get heard. All right. Kicking off, so what I'm going to talk about is, or what we're going to discuss, as I mentioned, is the intersection between privacy and copyright. And that's because copyright is about using or exercising control over your creative work. Privacy is also about ex exercising control, and it's about exercising that control or autonomy over your individual image, your personal information, and so those two things can go hand in hand together. The Copyright Act recognises this and it has this tiny little section which gives a very limited privacy right to people who for personal purposes um, commission artistic works such as photos or films and they have that right even where they don't then hold the copyright or own the copyright they still have the right to stop those um, photos or films from being distributed in public, from being exhibited in public, or from being further sold or used. So a really good example of that is wedding photos. You might want to have wedding photos taken by an artist. Um, the artist obviously wants to be able to hold the copyright in what they've created, but you don't want that artist to then go and sell them or to exhibit them in public without your say-so because that's your personal information about something that can be very personal to you. And so the Copyright Act tries to respect that intersection there. So the Copyright Act and the Privacy Act sit within a legal landscape. What we also have to keep in mind is that the Bill of Rights Act exists and the Bill of Rights Act um, sets out in section 14 that freedom of expression is a fundamental right that we have in New Zealand. So we have to balance not only the way that creative artists can exercise their control through copyright, how individuals can exercise their personal control over their personal information, also how people can have the freedom of expression to say and disseminate what they want to. And then further to that, we also have other things like um, tort law, which sets out, so that's for example, a Hosking and Runting case, where the court found that there is a limited right to privacy in common law, and that that right to privacy controls um, the publicity of private facts, which the individual person would consider highly offensive. So for example, just taking a photo of someone on the street and publishing that might not be considered to meet that threshold, but taking a photo of someone sunbathing naked in their backyard and then publishing that might be considered to breach privacy in the tort law or in the common law. So what I wanted to discuss today was how do we manage this intersection between privacy and copyright? How do we make sure that people have um, their privacy respected while creative artists also have the right to um, 
essentially have some creative control and maybe make some kind of um, commercial gain from their copyrighted work. So for example, what about the interests of a child subject? A child who has been photographed and then later as an adult wants to exercise some agency over that photograph, even though the photograph has been exhibited by an artist. Or um, should there be a compensation for giving up a privacy right? After all, copyright is about making sure that people have the commercial, commercial exploitation. So perhaps if you give up your privacy so that someone else can make money, you should be compensated for that. Or if your images go viral on the internet, should you have a privacy takedown right that's similar to the copyright takedowns that we're all familiar with, like the DMCA takedowns in the United States? How do people think that this should intersect? And should the privacy rights be more expanded in the Copyright Act? Or um, should they be reflected somewhere else? So this is where I wanted to start the discussion. So. I wanted to kick off with the first question of what do you think about the rights of a child subject? How should these be treated under privacy and copyright? Oh, kia ora. Um, I'll just start off by making the point that clearly a child cannot knowingly consent to the way that their image is, is reused. I mean, and they probably don't have the foresight to understand how an image in the public domain could be you know, reinterpreted or reused. So clearly, there's the, in, in principle, there's certainly a case to be made that children need to be protected and possibly protected you know, in, the, in future circumstances where, for example, a parent has given the right away to use the picture of the child as a baby and then the adult uh, finds that that's embarrassing if it's still, you know, if it's still in the public domain. So in principle, I think that there's, there's a case for some level of control. The counter to that is if you formulate that control too widely, um, you can create scenarios where, for example, well, very recently, Max Mosley, you know, the son of Edward, Edward Mosley in, uh, in the UK, has tried very hard to stop the Daily Mail uh, publishing lurid details of a Nazi-themed orgy that he participated in, um, which you might say is personal, except that there's plenty of evidence that his politics actually align with his sexual preferences. Um, so is, is it in the public interest to allow people who have power to sub, you know, retroactively control the way that information about them is, is made available? And I think that's the core tension. Absolutely, and um, I wanted to touch on that point in that as a child under the Privacy Act, children are treated as individuals just as anyone else. There's no specific age where you have to get consent from a parent versus consent from the child themselves. And part of that is to reflect the fact that it's very contextual, that some 12-year-olds might be very mature and be able to understand what they're consenting to in certain circumstances, but some 15-year-olds, because of the nature of the information or because of the maturity level of the child involved, having a hard and fast line of consent where a child stops needing the parental consent and starts being able to engage themselves creates very difficult issue, issues to deal with. Um, but I agree that it, it is about that control and it does raise very um, interesting points. Um, kia ora. Um, as well as the role of a, a parent, which I am, in um, trying to make sure that my child has both independent and a voice, but also has an agent to act on their behalf if needs be. I'm also thinking about schools where often they're seen as acting in loco parentis. So when there's issues like school trips, um, other activities, often images of children are captured and sometimes used in local papers. Now that, if it's not done responsibly, could actually sort of also have um, negative consequences. So it's that thing of, both the responsibility of whoever's publishing the photos, but who is acting in that agent for child type of role. And I don't know if there's standards or clarity, because often there's things of like, yeah, I was fine with that, but mm, maybe not. So 
it's just um, another discussion area. So, so another thing that I'm thinking as well is that while irrespective of the issue of consent, kids certainly can be content creators with current technology. And that becomes really complicated as those become out of alignment. I don't really have any value to add to that, but it's, it makes one think. Um, I, is this on? Oh, um, I can, consent, and it's still on the consent thing. Um, when I was a child, there was no such thing as Twitter, and going viral on Twitter was an, an, just wasn't a thing. So how do we, how do we, how do we find consent for an unknown and an uncertain technological future? We've got no idea what the trending cool toy is for tomorrow. The flip side of that is, is of course, then how do we stop ourselves from finding a world where we're biasing a presentation of humanity which is void of something because they don't have a voice yet, and we are their loco parentis, or you know, as, as parents, or as, as you know, I don't know. It's a real, it's a real challenge. But I wonder about how do we, how do we find consent as a concrete thing when it's an abstract notion of, of an uncertainty that we're kind of dealing with? I'd like to uh, ask how this concept of the child relates to, let's say, historical um, imagery that might go back to the 50s or something like that and some creative processes going on and it wishes to use images that Let's say I'm trying to write a documentary or do a film about my family, and one of my family members is completely disassociated, right? And so, you know, the thing being is, uh, with a, a story that needs to be told, um, somebody who's a total ad adult referring back to internal family photographs and things like that and saying, you cannot use my image. Um, when that is, to me, patently ludicrous when the family context, you know, if there hasn't been criminal activity. So, you know, how extreme can this go? Absolutely. And I think it's important to recognise that the Privacy Act governs how information is collected. So, in Information Privacy Principle 4 says that you can't collect information, which includes photographs, um, of an individual if that's unfair or if it would impact, um, what do I, what does it say? By means that in the circumstances are unfair or that intrude to an unreasonable extent upon the, um, the personal affairs of the individual concerned. So for example, um, one of the things that I was thinking about as I was preparing this was the trend now for women or people who are giving birth to hire photographers to take photos of them as they're giving birth, which can be a very powerful thing for some people to do. But what's the right of that child? Is that photograph impacting or intruding to an unreasonable extent upon their first entry into the world? And so it becomes very complex to think about those interrelated um, questions between the rights of one individual and the rights of the other. As you mentioned, it's about your family and your documentary that you're putting together, but it's also about the personal information of someone else in your family. So I just wanted to comment on a couple of things. Like the first thing is, should there be, it's just throwing it out there, a kind of a time limit? So if you're being photographed in the position of coming into the world, do you have a time limit on that? If you've got a, um, you know, you know, it's quite a hard thing to think that, you know, when you're 60, 70, whatever, then you're suddenly going to stop or not want to have that image out there because you change your ideas, change as you move through your life. And the other thing that I was really wanting to throw in as well is that idea that you talked about how you gather information. So as a, as a person who was trained as a journalist, we were always taught that if you took a photo in a public area, it was, it was fine. You know, like if you saw a, I mean, the classic is the celebrity walking down the street with his kid, his child or whatever, you could legitimately take that picture. So, you know, that's sort of, I guess, where all the different ideas intersect. Definitely. So the journalists aren't covered by the Privacy Act. They have an exemption for the reporting. But um, one thing that we've noted, which was a complaint last year, 
was about that gathering of the image. So a woman was at the races. She had her photograph taken by Fairfax and that was posted on stuff. Then a spray on tan company took her photograph off stuff without permission of the photographer or the website and started using her image to sell or advertise their, their spray tan. So where were her rights in that situation? Under the Privacy Act, it's, it's based on a harm metric. So if she could say that she had suffered some kind of harm from them using her personal information to sell their spray tans, she may have remedies under the Privacy Act. But what other remedies might she or should she be able to have given that they are commercially exploiting her likeness to sell their product without anyone's permission, including the photographer whose copyright they're breaching by using that photograph? And, and related to that, another thing we're starting to see um, is the identification of images that previously would have been lost, particularly recent changes to Facebook, and so you get a lot of incidental images where you're in the background. And that brings up a whole lot of other issues because it's not just about taking the photograph on consent, it's, mm. I, yeah, and that, that muddies the water more because it's not just about the collection of data, it's about the mm. aggregation mm. and re-identification of that data. Um, I, and just taking it even further still, I think that's a great point. Um, so, you know, I work in the National Library, we have collections of staff. This digital stuff will be the memory of the nation into the future, long after we're all gone. Um, what happens then about this harm and this image and, and, and images that we may or may not collect? Is there, are we going to end up in a situation where we're not forming collections which are cross-representative of our society because we are limiting what we do and how we capture because of a, a real and, and genuine privacy concern today, mm. but the cost is for tomorrow, where we don't have the same um, um, a pictorial, for example, a textual record of, of our society and our culture in, in 100, 300, 500,000 years' time. Definitely, and I think a lot of people who are working in those sorts of areas are thinking about those situations. You don't have to have someone's consent to collect their personal information, but it does need to be for a lawful purpose and a purpose that is necessary. And ideally, they need to know what you're collecting and how it will be used. So I think as long as that's more carefully managed and people are thinking about that use and collection, Um, I'll just respond to that really quickly, if that's okay. Um, what if we don't know that it's going to become a collection of merit or a collection of note? So somebody is just doing their, their daily business, whatever it may be, graphic designer, photographer, whatever, and they become a person of merit and their whole collection suddenly becomes in scope. We haven't asked for express permission at the time of the creation of the image because we didn't know they were going to suddenly become nationally relevant or interesting. So this after-the-fact mechanism, which is similar to the rediscovery mechanism, the value, the intrinsic value of the object and the privacy bound within it pivots as, as, it, as it moves through time. So I think, you know, I think we would all, I think that's an okay principle to start with. Mm. How do we deal with a retro problem, particularly if we can't go back to the, all those faces in a, in a, in a crowd shop, for example, and say, hey, are you okay with us using this image? You know, so I, don't, I think it's an, it's, it's an ongoing and big, big problem. Um, yes, yeah, so um, coming back to a point that uh, you raised a little earlier um, about things going viral, for example. I mean, most of the uh, privacy legislation that we have in place at the moment um, is very much about material collected for a purpose, usually by an organisation, rather than things that find their way into the public domain by accident, such as a picture going viral or incidental pictures or an uh, identification of information and in incidental uh, images or material. Um, that you might not have otherwise found out. Um, so I think that's something we should be thinking about, and particularly around social media, mm. as to how privacy affects people from day to day. Is that something that the uh, social media providers need to be worrying about? I'm sure they are. Um, is it something that we ourselves need to worry about a lot more than we do? I was going to say that too because if you think about it, like your question about the the um, 
uh, the, the, um, whether or not something becomes significant after it's been taken. You know, you said journalists are exempt, but what is a journalist? I mean, that whole definition is completely different now. So we kind of are thinking, oh, journalist is someone who works for Fairfax or NZ Herald or something, but they're not. I mean, if you write a blog and one person reads it, you're kind of like doing journalism, right? So I think it's almost as if you have to redefine or not define anything. And hinging off that, what I wanted to raise as well was that in the EU, they're beginning to look at this um, concept called essentially the right to be forgotten. And there have been cases where people have taken Google, for example, to court to say, stop publishing that outdated search result when you search my name. I don't want that associated with me anymore. It's no longer me. It no longer represents me. I want that forgotten. So that's even more about the control of your own personal information. But how would that interact with the copyright um, rights of the commercial holder or with, um, for example, the National Library creating the um, exhibitions or collections of note? What do you think about the right to be forgotten? How do you see that working? I would like to see this issue very carefully debated because I'm very concerned about the form of its expression, the right to be forgotten. I'm a librarian by training, and I'm very conscious that I could look up the Times Index and find a piece of information in analog form that actually isn't out of, um, in, in digital form necessarily, and which is there forever, and which gives us the context of something that happened. I think there should be a right to amend, um, but I don't think there should be a right to be forgotten. Um, because I think that really that distorts history. And I think there's some real issues which have come up um, in New Zealand in relationship to things like blogs and law cases where it is really important that we have that context available to us um, so that you can judge actually where the facts lie. I completely agree with the uh, previous commentator, thank you. Um, the thing I might add to that is that, in principle, if, uh, if you're going to give people the right to be forgotten digitally, I mean, why does that not then apply to uh, the right to be forgotten in analogue media? I mean, would we have to go through all the archives of all the newspapers, you know, burning the stories and make, or you know, blotting them out, perhaps redacting them? Probably not with PDFs, looking at recent government experiences. Um, but, but it raises all kinds of questions about how much control you can exert and whether, as the previous commentator said, you're rewriting history. Mm -hmm. So at the centre of that, if you go, it, there may be circumstances where the right to amend or correct has mm -hmm. to be expanded. Mm -hmm. um, the right to be forgotten, I think, would be dangerous. And if you're going to have it, and there may be circumstances where it's perfectly reasonable, um, for, I don't know, imagining cases of someone who wants a history of their, I don't know, experience of being kidnapped or raped or something like that and they don't actually want that in the public realm where they were a victim we'll think maybe that's fair enough um, but you have to have a public interest argument I think at the heart of that um, I'm open to be corrected but uh, the right to be forgotten I think at the moment is not about the right to say this information has to be scrubbed from the internet it's about the right to not have that information indexed in search engines. Um, and I think there's a whole range of different positions on that one, and then you get into this really slippery territory about, okay, what about the underlying history? Mm. Um, and should there be the right to remove that? I'm also at the National Library, um, mm. and my job is in collecting the, the published output of New Zealand as it is created, mm. um, and so, in a few of the different um, roles of the National Library, we do get people um, who would assert in different ways a right to be forgotten. Um, and those are really complex questions to have to answer. Um, but as a memory institution, um, then we have to err on the side of not losing our memory, but then how do you um, regulate how you provide access to that while, without actually getting rid of the content? Yeah, so, so I was just going to, the, the right of personal privacy in relation to right to be forgotten, I've got two totally opposing views on, which is 
um, those um, friends who have um, transitioned to um, new legal documents, different gender, different name, all the rest of it. And when someone in the media starts dead naming them, there's a sort of quite well-known case in the UK of a journalist who was hounding um, a teacher and subjecting her to so much sort of negative content that she ended up killing herself. And that's partly the that how far the information goes. And on the other hand, we have all these issues where people um, try to wash out their history of sex abuse um, as, as perpetrators. So I'm just sort of saying that the whole issue of personal privacy um, is, is quite different in a way from the public interest, but it, it overlaps. So, sorry, I don't have a clear point there. Um, I, I was just going to make a, a similar point, really. Um, I think we... I, I really wrestle with the idea of who's right to what is stronger. Um, hypo entirely hypothetical. I'm a blogger. I have some political views which are perhaps unsavory, and I'm very um, prolific in my bloggings. It turns out that this um, mechanism maybe is affecting my ability to find work, and I want my blog to be removed. So I delete it, but somebody has archived that. What's more important? Is it important that society and history remembers what we've been saying on part of our social discourse? Or is it more important that I as an individual have a right to unpublish things that I've said in a public setting? Um, and I really wrestle with that, I, I'm hypothetically, as, as where, where, where's the stronger right and where's the lesser harm, I think. Yeah, and um, so as I'm listening to all of this, I'm wondering if it's an issue of forgetting or an issue of emphasis and who's telling the story. So if we look at anyone's personal data, you have certain rights over the story that tells about the accuracy of it. Um, as someone myself who has had to do the retroactive name change stuff for transgender related reasons, it's hard. Um, and we live in a world where things don't sink away like they used to. So it comes down to the only way you have at present to fix that is to tell a new story louder and hope that no one screams louder than you against you. So that emphasis problem, that indexing problem, yeah, history doesn't change, but you shouldn't have someone else defining your identity or what, telling your story in a completely uncontrolled way. That's why we have professionals with professional ethics, standards, and associations. So there's gotta be a balance in there somewhere, but maybe there can't be. I think about this, you know, I always sit back and go, don't let technology um, cloud the way you look at things. Um, we talk about the right to be forgotten, but that only applies to the digital realm. We've talked about analogue storage, but also we're also talking about living memory. So if somebody says, you know, if you blog about your um, whatever you blogged about, and now want to be forgotten about because um, you're getting some backlash. Well, you know, I still remember you writing that. Even though I didn't, it didn't pop up on a web search, I still remember you writing that. I'm still, I've still got a right to make a call on, hey, you did that. Why shouldn't your next employer have the right to have that call just because they didn't see it? because it didn't show up in a, in, a, in, a, in a web search. You know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an element here of, do we allow the right to be forgotten to be used to hide either past misdeeds or facts about ourselves that you have already intentionally put into the public domain? Yeah, I kind of am echoing that point where um, I think one of the things I'm hearing is, uh, that we have these amazing tools at our disposal and they are incredibly convenient, but they're uh, substandard, basically, and uh, they come with these conditions that our uh, content uh, gets on, put on these servers that we don't control. And I wonder if, uh, we heard Corey say earlier, like he runs his own mail server. Um, I have my own NAS box at home where all my images go, and I can share those images directly with people that I choose. Um, I use peer-to-peer -peer social networking, uh, which doesn't go through servers. Um, my content is like, I control where it goes. And I think that for me, if I post something on Facebook, I consider that the public realm. 
I, I, I consider like it's gone. Like if I and if someone else links me in there or if something goes up there, I consider that I've got no control over that. That's my personal view on it uh, because I have zero trust in these organizations. And I think uh, if we if we want to really change this, I think we be need better tooling and we need to demand better tooling that actually uh, caters to our own personal choice. It, it looks as if, if I read David Harvey's book, which I've only just borrowed this last week, um, on this kind of issue, it looks as if from that and the statements from John Key and from two or three acts which deal with the ticks and GCSB, that really we've lost the right to privacy of information in some ways if, when it's come to the internet. I'm very disturbed and sad to believe that's the case, and I'd love to see us do something about it, but it looks to me as if you can't really say it's not public anymore if you put it out there publicly. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, my concern is where you haven't put it out there publicly and it's being picked up by the big companies, and I think that's an issue I'd love to see us dis discuss. Mm. Yeah, so people always say, oh, privacy is dead, right? I don't think privacy is dead. And I was speaking with an academic recently who said he made a really good point, which I think was that just because you choose to share certain elements of your personal information on Twitter doesn't mean any less that you do not have that core of inherent dignity to your own personal information. And that choosing to share something on Twitter doesn't mean that you become entirely public. And it shouldn't mean that we assume that either. I was just going to emphasize that I have no problem about personal privacy, what date you were born, what street you were born on, you know, whether you like pink, whether you like blue. But I am absolutely against the use of people being able to scrub their histories because there are known there are offenses which they have committed which have not yet actually been able to be brought to the public book. And by scrubbing their, you know, history, if you like, it makes it incredibly difficult for a forensic um, a journalist or a forensic analyst, if you like, to present that in whatever medium uh, that should be. So I don't see that people have any right, personally, to be able to undo what they have been fundamentally responsible for doing and using the cloak of uh, personal privacy to be able to un unlock it. I just want to ask a question to counter that, which is that with the, in, with the increasing use of the internet, what we've seen alongside that is the increasing use of what people refer to as revenge porn, or the sharing of someone's intimate images as a way of exercising control or abuse over them, often after an intimate relationship ends. So the Harmful Digital Communications Act um, was passed in order to help combat that. And I would say for every, for every instance of someone scrubbing the internet to get rid of the fact that they used to support unsavory political parties or had views that were less than um, pleasant, what about the person whose intimate images are shared on the internet? What rights should they have to scrub the internet of those that abuse of their personal information in such an intimate way? Um, I just wanted to... <laughs> I certainly will. <laughs> yeah, now. Here, here we have a a clear and specific example of a harm that is being done to an individual. Mm -hmm. This harm, though, does not define the individual. So uh, seeking to remove those images, in my opinion, is not just right, but you know, should be mandatory to go after that uh, type of thing. But that person who is the victim of that should not then have the right to be able to scrub their identity, if you like, from the internet. And everything else that was to do with them by that way. So one offence, if you like, does not then give a broader um, uh, licence to uh, cover that person's um, uh, activity in the community. Um, I just wanted to respond to uh, the frequent sort of 
cynical view that uh, we hear around sharing on uh, public servers like on Facebook, like on Google. Um, I can definitely relate to the idea that oh, you just shouldn't post anything to Facebook unless you're considering it. It's practically public now. Don't you? You just accept that when you when you post. The problem is that these organisations present a very strong illusion of privacy. They will actively tell you that you can maintain a private gallery, that you can control who you're sharing information with, uh, and this is done very deliberately and very specifically. They're, no, they're not mincing words about this, they're saying you can have private stuff and you can have non-private stuff. I think a degree of cynicism is healthy because these are corporations and, and it's not always going to work perfectly. But I also don't think that we can allow that to mean that we allow these people to get away with giving an illusion of privacy that doesn't actually stand up. I was going to um, make a very similar point, um, but on the on the forensics and covering up a one's history side, in a previous role I used to work for the police in forensics, um, it's an unscribable circle. You you don't know about an offence until after the fact. So, you uh, it's kind of impossible, I would suggest, to say you're scrubbing your history until you know that the history has been scrubbed. Like, how do you know somebody's cleaned up after themselves until you know that there's something that's not there anymore and you don't know it's there? So, it's a really difficult problem to solve. Um, knowing that something has been cleaned up intentionally to cover something up, basically. Like, you, if they've done a good job, you'll never know, and therefore, how is it an offence? Because you don't know it was a thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a genuine problem. On, on my, I would say a bigger problem we have is with the Facebooks and those kind of um, platforms. It's not a coincidence that not long after I worked for the police in forensics, I stopped using social media. Um, make of that what you will. We only have to look a couple of years ago at... Um, I forget the name what it was called colloquially, but there was um, a big breach of um, celebrities' personal photos in very compromising positions. Um, and that was people who had an, an implicit trust in the mechanism. They had trust that the images that they had created to, for their own use within their own friendship groups, one presumes, um, had, had leaked out into the, private, into, into the public world. And they became um, currency. So, you know, we've got, we've got a problem. We've both got a, an, an educational problem and a technology problem. And arguably, I would suggest that the, 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 the mechanism of privacy belongs in the people who are making money. On the one hand, we're told that our stuff is safe and don't worry about it. They're making an awful lot of money out of this mechanism. And when there's a damage it's individual and a lot of harm is caused to the individual. And so I don't think something, I think there's an imbalance there somewhere. And I, I don't know. So, so I lived and worked in the US for a few years and I saw a couple of things over here which sort of highlight aspects of this debate. The first one which I see because I work in security is the problem of doxing. These are facts about people that are being released. Now, you could argue they're fact and free speech and all that. But the other thing I see, and this is particularly in certain states in the US, is arrest records, which are public fact, public record. Now, they don't actually prove you've committed a crime, but it is very, very, very common for employers to filter people on the basis of that, combined with the fact that communities are not policed evenly. Mm -hmm. So what you get is you get these factual bases being amplified through technology to systematize the problems in society. Mm -hmm. um, now, as for the social media thing, I work in security, and there are two types of people in my industry. There's the people who disappear underground, and they don't have any story online. Okay. There's also the opposite. Those of us who tell our own story. The reason we do that is because at the same time, if you don't have control of your online shadow identity, someone else will. So there are pros and cons both ways, and it comes down to the power dynamics. Absolutely, and I think in terms of um, employers relying on information they've found about you, we've put out recommendations around that and one of the recommendations is do not rely on what you find on the internet. You can look up your prospective employee, but don't rely on the information you find there without at the very least giving that person a chance to either say, look, I've got an ex-boyfriend who constantly puts stuff about me online that is fake, and I can prove that, and in actual fact, here's the real story, or to say, yes, that is true about me, but let me contextualise that, let me tell you my story about it. I, you know, they might have changed, they might have um, gone through reform or something along those lines, but in any case, 
it is very poor practice and it can be a breach of the Privacy Act to rely on information without ascertaining its correctness. And one of the best ways that you can ascertain that correctness is to present it to the person it's about and let them shape it for you. Um, I'd just like to say that, also add that there's a positive right to privacy. Um, it's not conditional on anything other than you have a right to privacy. So questions about um, building law or regulation on the basis that you might have something to hide is equivalent to saying you can't have a right to privacy because uh, what have you got to hide? So looking at you know, wiping your history, scrubbing your history, well, so what? Um, why not? That's as positive a your right under concepts of personal privacy as anything. Yeah, I I'd like to just go back to an issue that we raised earlier on about the nature of consent here. It seems to me that one of the core issues that we're dealing with is whether or not the information that we've provided actually does belong to us. We had an expectation that it belongs to us and would be used in a particular way. Now, if I'm right, the Privacy Act actually requires that information collected about you on a personal level, for example, by an employer, uh, should be used for the purpose that it was intended. When I work in education, I get access to my students' records. You know, I'm allowed to check their grades and, and make sure that they've attended class. I can't go looking up their phone numbers to call them, though. You know, that, that, that would, I mean, unless it was for an important academic reason, such as they missed the exam. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no pretext for me to use that information. That principle could apply in other cases as well, including, for example, the revenge porn argument. You know, that it was okay to do the film with your boyfriend, but <laughs> you didn't think that was going online. Mm. Um, the, other, the other issue it applies to, um, perhaps in the other way, is that uh, f Facebook and other social media, when you join them, actually claim all the information you have. So it's not just a case of saying, oh, well, you may as well assume it's public. Well, that may be true, but what you must assume, given the contract, is that all that information that you put on social media belongs to the social media company. Now, it's still yours under copyright. You can still use it. They can't stop you using it, but you've given the right to Facebook. All your photographs, anything other than personal messages, Facebook can use in whatever way they like. Um, and so the question is, do we know that? Are we actually aware of the consent that we're giving? And that seems to be an operative principle here. Um. I just wanted to make a comment I'm acknowledging um, um, people's reservations about um, those who want to scrub their records um, because, you know, they could be still bad guys. Um, but to put that in context, um, people have a right to change. And in fact, <laughs> it should, I mean, it's people change. <laughs> they, they don't need a right to change. It's just something that we all do. And um, we need to uh, be free to move on, um, not just from um, bad things, although particularly if you've done something bad and you have then made amends or whatever, why should you have that millstone around your neck forever and ever and ever? Um, particularly if it's going to be in some sort of situation where it limits your, um, your, limit, it limits your ability to have a life. And that's what it can do now. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that that's really important that when we look at this intersection of, of, of privacy um, and the web, that we need to, to bear that in mind. Because if you're not allowed to change, why bother even trying to be a better person than you were? I, I think that uh, in the era of the tech lash, we've lost sight of one of the most effective tools we have for changing the way we relate to companies, which is um, tools that limit how the companies can, can get a look in on us or, or how much manipulation they can undertake of us. You know, ad blocking is the largest consumer revolt in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. Facebook has this position that it is literally impossible to be friends with people on the internet unless you tell Mike's, Mark Zuckerberg every single fact about your life. But you could imagine continuing to use Facebook without ever telling Mark Zuckerberg anything. Like, for example, you could have a bot that logged into Facebook for you and scraped everything you might look at and then chose locally which things you should see. So Mark Zuckerberg never saw what you were looking at or how you were interacting with people. 
right now, license agreements get in the way of that and the, their enforceability. But, um, you know, Larry Lessig says that we operate uh, our society on the strength of four forces, code, law, norms, and markets. And if all we ask for is law, if we, if we only can claim our rights when we can get a legislature to embody them and then a court to uphold them, then we uh, impoverish all of the other ways that we, can, that we can push back and hold our rights. One of the things you see with ad blocking is that it's disciplining firms. Firms are changing the kinds of ads that they make to make them less obnoxious because ad blocking does what legislation can't do on its own, which is cost them money. Another um, another point I think is around, and I think you were touching on a bit earlier, was around the um, aggregation of stuff. Um, so so over here we have the um, housing tribunal. If I put in a housing um, tribunal claim, even if I win or lose, it's it's on a it's on a public website, and and my name and my address can be searched. Um, and and I, I I moved house a few months ago, and um, my my new landlords they use a private service which scrapes the. Um, the, the tribunal database, and they look back beyond that which the government makes available via the tribunal website. So my right to be forgotten is kind of gar is eroding. The purpose still remains. It's about demonstrating a fact around a, a, a tenancy thing. I would I would question its viability as a product, but but it obviously exists. Landlords use it. Um, and there's another related kind of function. So so we have the papers passed um, platform, which is all of the newspapers that we've scanned. And there's something interesting that happens when you make lots of data available. You can start to do interesting things. And so things that we were not perhaps worried about it previously, suddenly with a keystroke I can search for me and my ancestors and interesting facts suddenly become serviceable. And we see that in the trends and the things which become virally interesting and in a blip is just this one advert which may have been long forgotten 100 years ago but suddenly is cool and suddenly is interesting because it's contextually relevant in the day. So, you know, it's, it's one of the... It's one of the things, and, and it's one of those things that just makes me uncomfortable. You don't want to prohibit it, but at the same time, it's its own kind of enemy, really. I don't know. I don't know. More questions? Sorry. Um, I'd just, I just like to um, come back a little bit at the idea of Facebook and consent. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what that means. Um, consent um, in what way? Um, positive privacy, again, would suggest that um, you perhaps can't consent away something that you might wish to retrieve um, at some time in the future or um, under the existing principles. Um, the question of consent isn't exactly um, prominent in, in the, if at all, in, in the principles. Um, you're given a set of positive um, rights right from the start. Um, and for instance, it, it, it would not be a question of consent necessarily if, for instance, Facebook asked you for information um, that wasn't related to their, you know, the purpose of their business. Um, and in other areas of law, um, you can't consent away your common, your common law rights or your rights under the um, Consumer Protection Act, for instance, or not simply. Um, and in, in relation to Facebook, which jurisdiction are they operating under and do we actually have an effective, um, can we have a pro positive um, approach to privacy to a company that belongs somewhere else abroad? So I was at another event recently where this sort of discussion came up and a key thing particularly that relates to consent is a concept of uh, shadow identities. So as you do things and as the people around you do things online, they leave metadata. Now, what I mean by shadow identity is a hole where you would be if you were on that service. You never consented to the collection of that data. So when you get to laws on personal, personal information, all too often they say, well, if you're never involved, then that is the data belongs to the company involved. So, the, so Facebook has a shadow identity if you never join from all of your friends, all of their contacts, all of the photos you're in. And they claim ownership of that identity. You have no consent, you have no say in that transaction. So there's not just your actual identity and things you're actively involved in. There's things which are the holes where you would be or you could be, or in their eyes, you should be. And that is something law does not deal with very well. Um, 
I was just going a little bit back a little bit though because I've been thinking about this one in that um, with the right to be forgotten and there's the how it applies with um, crowdsourcing in that there's a growing you see it more and more with, with memory institutions and things like that where they put up a photo a grouping of photos of students from schools where they don't know or random photos that they've collected in a collection and they say who are these people and you also get those media internet media ones oh, I took this photo with X on the beach in Hawaii can you help me identify it and there's some of, often those photos were taken with the implication of privacy or with were just really shared within a class group or with a, in a group of um, soldiers if it was on a battlefield, you know. So there's that whole range of um, privacy around memory institutes and, and who owns the copyright on those photos when you put them up online to crowdsource information around them. And that, so that adds that another layer of complications into a, a lot of what um, we do in memory institutes and, dig, and digitization programs. And also, yeah, just... Random. Um, this is just a sort of general concept that's been bubbling in my head over the course of this conversation that there's not necessarily a private sphere and a public sphere and I think uh, Jay got into it a little bit in the context of once you put something up on the paper's past newspaper platform um, the, the context changes and the fact that it's much more accessible than it used to be changes things as well. Um, and so there was an example, I think in America a few years back where they wanted to digitize, may not have the details exactly right, but it was like a, a feminist pornography magazine and the people who had participated in it when it was originally being created had given permission to the magazine um, and then they wanted to digitize it as you know, it's just kind of a source of pride and a, a feminist thing, but because that context changed, now this is going to be freely available online, um, that was really, really problematic, and I think in the end they had to pull it all back down. Um, and also um, in the context of Twitter, which is inherently a, a public platform, um, but if you're tweeting within, say, you know, your, your circles are largely um, activist circles or something like that, and then the story gets picked up in the media and your tweet gets embedded, um, in a story in a general news publication, then depending on what the story is, that could invite an army of trolls to descend on you in a way that you never would have intended when you made the tweet in the first place. So um, the context of public and private um, change depending on how available this public thing is and how much attention is drawn to it. Definitely. I think that's, a five, that's our five minute warning, so... If anyone has any remaining points, we've got one here, one down the back. I shout out to anyone who hasn't yet had a chance to participate to speak up now, if if you've got anything. We'll go here first. Just really quickly, just following with what Amy said, um, perhaps with the right to privacy, perhaps part of it is also the right to add your own context. And I think maybe that's part of it, is to be able to say, yes, this is me, and yes, this is why, or whatever. I think you touched on it as well. So maybe there's a right to a context or something like that that goes with privacy. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight something. I think it was Corey who said that um, the, the where the Copyright and the Privacy Act intersect in a way is that you can't create applications, and I could be wrong here, onto Facebook or something that would enable you to scrape or to get rid of your being identified or whatever, because if you did, that would be a breach of that copyright of that of Facebook or, or whatever that organisation was. And I thought that was a really interesting intersection where copyright was actually present, preventing your ability to buy or purchase something that would help enable your privacy. So... Yeah. Was I correct? Or? I think along those lines, that's what he was saying. We've got one here down the back. Yeah. Thanks. It was just, it was a comment I've been thinking about. I mean, my understanding of the Copyright Act at the moment is that if you commission, if you commission, um, say, wedding photos, um, you, the, photo, the copyright goes to you as the first owner. No. If you've commissioned it. But photographers tend to get you to sign them out, mm. to sign out mm. of them. Mm. I've totally lost my point of where I'm going, partly because you keep shaking your head at me. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> so if you want to. As I understand it, the copyright still vests in the artist, but you have 
a privacy right that attaches to you as the commissioner. That's Maybe I have it wrong. Yeah. So what that means is that the artist who creates it still has the copyright, but that you control how the information, how the photograph is used. So for example, you can say to them, I don't want you to put this on your portfolio or on your public blog. I don't want you to sell it to another party to use to advertise weddings. Coming back to talking about children, how we started. And um, uh, I can't remember what it's called. Is it our Secrecy Act that things become available in the public domain after a bunch of years? Is it the Public Records Act? Yeah. So I was just kind of wondering, like, is there something in there of uh, some sort of time limit where things will default into the public, but like they're essentially not searchable and not indexable for, say, 30 years or something, unless they then assert that they should still remain private or something like that? So it like defaults into the public at some point? Yeah. I was just trying to bring it all the way back. Absolutely. All right, I think that's about wrapping up in terms of time. In fact, we have one minute left. So any final points or questions to make? So that was just for the recording. Has everyone read Facebook's Terms of Use? <laughs> information and give it out. It's a great place to start. If I have to do something nasty for a client and I want to get my head around how to do it, um, that's a place to go and look. Plain language, clear to understand, clearly explains exactly how they go about taking all of your rights and your own information away from you. And it's a useful community resource in that respect. But that's like the... Um, sorry, tell, tell it's a recording. But that's like the terms and conditions that actually gave um, away the, the right to um, the firstborn child, which was included in a test one sort of recently, and the majority of people still signed up. All right, I think that's time for us to wrap up. Thank you all for participating in this session. I think it's been really helpful. <laughs> and um, I'll be on the panel later on this evening as well, this afternoon.